morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Zakaria, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations and Young Alumni Liaison here at the University of San Diego. I'm excited to have you join us today for the USD Wine Classics Young Alumni Network pre-reception Exploring California's Terroir with alumnus Jason Kimmel. The USD Young Alumni Network is an official affinity group of the USD Alumni Association dedicated to providing professional development and social networking opportunities like this one for USD alumni who graduated within the last 10 years and are under 35 years old. Before we begin, I would like to thank you for coming to the Wine Classic. This is our largest fundraiser for alumni endowed scholarships. As you may know, 70% of students, current students receive some form of financial assistance. A portion of your ticket price is contributed to the Alumni Endowed Scholarship Fund, which has benefited over 40 students since its creation in 2006 by USD alumni. Thank you for your support. Now let's continue on to our presentation. Please be mindful that today's presentation is being recorded. Access to the slides and audio will be found on the University of San Diego's YouTube channel a few weeks from today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter. Jason Kimmel is the sommelier or wine steward of the 1,100-acre Kimmel Vineyards in Mendocino, California. Kimmel Vineyards produces 12,000 cases of wine annually and is one of the official participating wineries of the USD Wine Classic and has been with us since the beginning five years ago. Jason has studied wine in Italy with the local sommeliers in Tuscany and winemakers of Montalacino. And currently, Jason is a certified level two sommelier with the Court of, Masters, Court of Master Sommeliers. However, next Sunday, he is sitting for the Wine and Spirits Education Trust Advanced Diploma, which is on the path to becoming a master of wine. So congratulations and good luck <laughs> next week. <laughs> uh, Jason is also a USD alumnus. He received his bachelor's degree in business administration from the US, from University of San Diego in 2003. In his spare time, Jason is also the vice president of Cassidy Turley San Diego, a local market leader in commercial real estate services. Please help me in welcoming USD alumnus Jason Kimmel. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was great. And uh, yeah, we'll make this as interactive as possible to you guys. So if you have any questions, just jump in, and you know, I'm here for you guys to make this a, a fun event. So, um, like Sarah said, we're going to talk about California terroir today, and everyone thinks, "What the heck, terroir, terror? You know, what is this?" You know, it's such a abstract, funny thing. I actually have a pretty funny story. My I'm staying with my girlfriend a couple weeks ago, and I have this book on the table, and she goes, "You know, I'm, I'm I saw this book. You know, I'm a, a little bit." What, what is this? You know, I was concerned you had this funny thing called terror. What are you reading about terror? And I go, well, okay, okay. So it's California terror. Everyone thinks, of, you know, it's, so it's, it's a very fluid word. And it, it comes from uh, you know, the French term terroir or terra, which comes from the land. So what it's doing is it's really explaining all the different parts of the terroir of, of you know, all the aspects that make up uh, what the wine is. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit here, and the Court of Master Sommeliers, when you saw that pin there, it's, it's actually a really cool movie called Psalm that you can check out. It goes through this uh, very rigorous diploma to put you through all these crazy things. We have to know obscure wineries of Greece and all sorts of funny places. But it's a really, it's a, it's a great community of, of wine folks, and uh, it, it's a really fun thing. So you can check that out. So a little bit of the history. Why are we talking about terroir? Where does this come from? So terroir comes from France. It comes from Burgundy is the region, and they've been making wine in, in Burgundy for about 2,000 years. So a long time. Keep in mind, we've done wine here in America for about 150 years, maybe a little bit more. So good at terroir, and you know, why are these guys, you know, why do they know so much about it? So about 750 years ago, the Benedictine and Cistercian monks were in Burgundy. And these guys didn't have, they had a lot of time on their hands. So all they did was they went around in, in the land. The land was, the land spoke to what God said for them. So the land it was really a message from God to the bottle of how, how each part spoke. 
So they would go around and they would look at all these little pieces of land and they would say, you know, this one actually tastes different than this one and this one tastes different than this one. And keep in mind, these vineyards are, you know, half an acre to a hundred acres. So they're really small little pieces and they figure this out over, you know, a thousand years. So it takes a lot of time to figure out what is a terroir? Where should we grow grapes? So that's what we're trying to figure out here in, in California is where do we grow Zinfandel? Where do we grow Cab? Where do we grow Pinot? And today we're actually just going to be talking about Pinot Noir. So, and the reason being, so let's go over this really quick. So what, what is terroir really? And here's really the, the essence of, and thanks to Wine Folly, it's a pretty cool site. You can find some cool stuff on there. Um, terroir is really, it's everything. It's the climate, it's the soil, it's tradition. Everything that goes into that bottle of wine that you drink is really terroir. Whether it is from the, the style of the winemaker, whatever it is, it's that unique sense of place that we're all searching for on wine. So we're going to be drinking a really cool wine today, and we'll hold off for a few seconds. I'll, understand, I'll explain what it is um, by a really cool person, Josh Jensen, who does the Clara wine. So this is, this, is, this is what terroir is. It's everything all combined, and it's its own unique sense of place. It's like a fingerprint for, for someone. You know, each, each one of you is different because, because you are, and that's what terroir is. Um, that's what terroir is, and that's what's so fun about wine. So, Pinot Noir. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to use Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir, we're only it's one varietal. Instead of using the Bordeaux varietals, which are mixing and blending from Cabernet Sauvignon to Malbec to Pete Verdot, and those, those are all blended, which is a nice thing, but you don't get the same message that the Pinot Noir gives you, which is a very unique message that it's just one varietal, it's very transparent, and you can really see. What, how the land speaks. So we're going to be talking about Pinot Noir today and what we're going to do. So what does this all mean? Why, how do you get terroir? So the hotter the climate, it's going to change the aspect of the wine. So if, if the weather gets hotter, so California is a lot more hot than it is in parts of France because of it's higher up on the, the equator. So when you get in hot climates, you get more dark fruits. So when you guys are tasting wine today, you're going to see all this stuff. So you get more dark cherry versus part cherry. You get more red and black fruits versus the, the bright, you know, underripe type fruits. So the more ripe you get, the more hot you get, the more on Chardonnay it's more tropical and on Pinot it's going to be more blackberry and black currant type, type aromas. And then as far as oak uses, it's something that's big you want to talk about too because once you put oak on the wine, it changes it. You're going to get vanilla and you're going to get the spices. You're going to get all these different flavors because of the oak. So that's taking it a little bit away from terroir. But at the same time, it's nice to have the integration of the oak because it adds a nice vanilla tone. We're going to actually have some tasting scents for you guys today so you can taste the wine and then actually smell the scents to really understand, you know, what the heck is all this stuff. So then going on. So we're talking about California terroir. So terroir is a, is a is the California terroir obviously is, is tough to define. What, what is it? So there's a lot of different areas. We have Temecula. We have... Um, Sierra Foothills, we have Northern California, we have Napa Valley, there's all these different places. So what's going on with all these spots? When you look, as we go further east, obviously it gets a lot more hot as long as, as you're on the valleys. And when we're on the western parts, like the, this wine here that you guys are going to try today is actually from the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's one of, the, one of the coolest AVAs, AVA is an American viticulture area, it's a defined area for wine in California, similar to the regions of Burgundy, which we'll talk about a little bit too. So where are these different places? So North Coast is where the Sonoma area is in Mendocino. It's actually where our wine is made in Mendocino, so in the North, North Coast Appalachian. And there's some really hot areas. We're actually going to look at a graph later on different vineyard sites and how hot they actually get. So when you're in hot areas, you want to have grapes like Zinfandel. You want to have Cabernet Sauvignon. You want to have Merlot, things like that, because these wines handle a lot more heat than Pinot Noir, which I argue if you get it too hot, you lose the sense of the character of the wine and you get more of the blue and black fruits and you say, gosh, this almost tastes like a symphony. So it's tough. To, you can't grow Pinot Noir there. Not any good Pinot. So you have to go things like Cabernet and Zin and some other stuff like that. Great area, just a little bit more warm. And then Sonoma, which we're going to get to here, which we'll talk about is another fantastic growing area. But we're going to go back to France again to really understand, you know, why, why do we grow certain grapes in different spots? And when you study the French wine, it's almost like a little Disneyland. 
they have the little areas where you have the grapes, and each grape is in its specific area, and they're really tough on. You can't grow Chardonnay in this area. You can't grow it in this area. It's very particular. So when you look at this, all of you have probably heard of Bordeaux before. Bordeaux is where they grow a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Malbec and Petit Bordeaux. So that's, it's a coolish area, but it also gets relatively hot once you get on the east side. So you can grow. They figured out, okay, it's the best to grow Cabernet Sauvignon in this area. It's the best to grow Pinot Noir in this area. So when we get into Burgundy, which is the, the pinkish color there, that's where Chardonnay and Pinot is grown. It's the most famous Pinot Noir in the world. Their bottles can get up to you know, 10,000 bucks for, for wine, which is crazy. And then you go into the Loire Valley and you have different other varietals like um, you, it's, Loire is a little bit more tricky because you have Sauvignon Blanc and other ones. It's a mix. But each, what these guys are so famous for, and they've had 2,000 years, is where is the best place to grow this stuff? And that's what we're figuring out now. Where do we? Where does Pinot grow the best? Where does Cabernet Sauvignon grow the best? You know, where? Where? Because the tricky thing is, when you plant a vineyard, it takes six years to get wine, and then it takes another ten years to figure out if it's good. And it could, it could be thirty years later, and you're like, crap, this isn't even the right place to grow this stuff. So you waste a lot of money and time and frustration. It's really a guessing game. So we're we're gonna be where France is in a few years of figuring out. You know, and it, we have a lot more technology today too. Is, is look at into to really study. We can get there a lot quicker, but you know, it's it's this is a good model for us to follow. So then going into Sonoma County, this is a really cool AVA. That's just Napa Valley is right there. It's right on the right on the um, the coast. So you have a lot of different climates. You have the Bodega Bay area, which is a super super cool area where you have fog and it's a really really good Pinot Noir area. Then you get up into Knights Valley, which is way on the edge, which is a really good Cabernet Sauvignon area. And, in Merlot, so it gets really hot. Knights Valley will probably get to give you an idea, of, you know, 100 degrees, 105 degrees some days, where Bodega Bay doesn't really get over 72. So keep in mind, you know, you want to grow. That's where we're figuring out now where you want to grow the best stuff in what area. And then just to walk through this a little bit more, Dry Creek is an area that's fantastic for old vines. Then there are great Cabernet Sauvignons there. Can be some producers you're going to see from from Dry Creek today. Uh, Chalk Hill. So this is basically what we're trying to emulate with France a little bit here too. We have all these AVAs, but keep in mind these AVAs is thousands of acres. So you could say what's the you know what's the uh, terroir of you know Sonoma Coast? It's, it's, there are thousands of soil types. There are thousands of ways to grow wine there. It's it's broad. So we're we're getting from a big picture down to a small picture, and that's where that's where California is going as far as getting the terroir. So this is the different sizes too. So here, Sonoma Coast AVA is 2,000 acres, huge area. Fort Ross AVA is the newest AVA, which is the general area, is 500 acres. That's the, actually the smallest AVA, 500 acres. It's huge. When we're talking about the Cote d'Inouye, which is the Burgundy area, the northern area where they go the best Pinot, it's only it's 529 acres, but they have 124 vineyards, which everyone knows about. They're really famous. I can't name a vineyard in any of these other areas. Yeah, so we're getting there, and they're getting more famous. It just takes time, and you have to go through regulation, too. So Santa Cruz Mountains, so we can pick this glass up, and you guys are probably dying to drink some wine. Um, why don't you go ahead and, and smell it and see what you guys think. And I'm actually going to pass around some, uh, some wine scents here. So what we can do is we're going to compare these wine scents. Let's smell one. Actually, let's see it. And then we'll smell these and then compare it to what you had. And once you smell it, make sure you don't drink it too, because you could, you could get sick. So just smell it and then smell the wine, and, and you're going to pick up different scents. I'm going to tell you what they are here. Well, yeah, these are for the next one. Yeah. So what these different smells are, you guys, when, you, when they come around to you, the number 12 is strawberry, number 13 is raspberry, and there's little numbers on the vials too. Number 29 is violet. And number 18 is cherry. And to talk through this wine a little bit, this is Clara wine. It's made in the Santa Cruz Mountains by Josh Jensen, who's a really famous guy. He's done these classic Burgundian styles. So this is a very elegant Pinot. The second Pinot that we're going to try is very big and robust, and it's a little bit more heavy, so you're going to be able to compare the two. But in this one, it's limestone. It's, you know, it's more earthy and more elegant as you smell. So this is going to be a very Burgundian and French style. But you're going to pick up the strawberry, raspberry, violets, and cherry when you smell that. So this is a, it's a really good quality wine.
and talk about Santa Cruz Mountains a little bit. Santa Cruz Mountains is probably one of the most famous Pinot Noir areas in all of California. Today it's making the most exciting Pinot Noir. This is going to be the spot where you see a lot of really, really high-end Pinot Noir. There's certain producers like Rees is there today. Calera has been there a long time. And this is on, grown on limestone soil. And why limestone soil is so important is because limestone is always associated with clay. And with clay, you get slower ripening. So you get more elegant fruits, and you get more uh, earth tones, and you get more higher acid because, go ahead. Sure. Monterey Highlands is really close by. OK. But yeah. It's not. It's, it's not, yeah, which is also another fun spot. Yeah, jump in anytime you guys have questions. This is, I'm here for you guys. So then moving on from the Santa Cruz Mountains. So this is a really cool weather comparison chart here. Eighteen is cherry. Yeah. Did you pick up the cherry? Yeah, so I should talk about that. So it's called Lin Le something uh, Lin Linnaeus de Vigne. So it's the nose of the wine in French. Um, they're really cool. So when you're going through all the blind tasting, all these rigorous tests for these stuff I have to go through, they, you need to do blind tasting. So you need to know what, where's the wine from, what is it, what year is it. So it's a pretty rigorous, intense test. So these things help you. I have about 50 of them. And you go through and you smell truffle and cedar and all these weird things that you would never really smell in a day-to-day -day life. You know, when do you ever smell, you know, truffle unless you're eating at the wine classes last night or the wine dinner? Um, so it, it helps you run through and, and understand what the smells actually are. Yeah. Um, so then going back to the the weather comparison chart here, they have. Uh, the different areas, so if you look here at the bottom, it shows Calistoga, which is Calistoga is in Napa Valley. So you guys all know Napa Valley. And then this is actually comparing it to the same vineyard that we're drinking today. So right here. So you see the top, the hottest that it gets, you know, in, in Calistoga it's getting up to you know, almost 100 degrees for a couple months at a time. That's very, very hot for wine. And then you know, in Santa Cruz it's, you know, it's barely getting to you know, 80 degrees, 78 degrees in the hottest month. Keep in mind, for the most part, it's 60, 70 degrees, so it's very cool there. And that's where you're getting this very elegant pinot that you guys are drinking now. It's not that big, robust type, type pinot. You guys are drinking, yeah, yeah. OK. Oh, that's right, I thought, yeah. You guys thought you were going to drink today? OK, yeah, so what do you guys think of that wine? Anyone, Bill? <laughs> Thank you. Do you guys see the elegance in it? Do you, yeah, it's still, you still get some black fruits and nice and some violets, but it's, and it's lower alcohol. It's just 13.5 alcohol, too. Most Pinot Noirs you're going to get in California these days are over 14%, almost up to 15%. So the alcohol is really low. It's more of an elegant type pairing that a lot of sommeliers really enjoy. So jumping back into an area, this, so, to show you guys, this is an area called Gervais Chambertin. It's in France. So this is in the Côte de Nuit area. It's the northern Burgundy part. This is some of the most famous land in the world. These wines can be thousands and thousands of dollars. This is how broken up it is from the monks in the past, the Sturgeon monks. So you have all these little vineyards and all these little spots where this wine's going to taste different than that wine, and this wine's going to taste different than the Griot wine, and all these little spots. And this is where we're actually going to go with California wine in the future. We're going to have these vineyards that you talk to any famous wine person, they're going to know every single vineyard on here. They're that famous to where California, again, I hardly know any vineyards, the names of them. So we're getting there to a part where it's going to be really fun and unique. And uh, California is really going to be able to spread its wings a little bit more. So let's talk about the slope here. And actually, um, we need to probably go on to the next wine. But so if you guys can kind of sip, drink through this wine over the next few minutes, guzzle it. Go ahead, Phil. That's called Calera. Yeah. So no rush. Take your time. So I'll walk through this here, too. Go ahead. Yep. 
proper way to spit? Yeah. You want to try to make a nice arc and see how far you can spit it? <laughs> so you want to, talking about spitting here, you guys, because a lot of times when you're drinking this much wine and you don't spit, you're going to get really drunk. And this is 14. It's beer. Keep in mind, beer is 6% alcohol. This is 14. If you're drinking a lot of wine, you're going to get drunk, which is good and bad news. You know? You're going to enjoy yourself. So as far as spitting, what you want to do is swirl it in your mouth so you can really oxidize the wine and you can really get all the tones of it. And then spit it out. Just don't be afraid to spit it in that bucket there. Yeah. Yeah, just spit. Yeah. But spitting, and keeping in mind, you guys, when you are spitting wine, you're actually going to taste the wine better because your salivation, sal salivatory glands wake up even more and you taste the wine even at a more extreme sense because your body's thinking, I want to drink this, and you're not letting yourself do it. So you're actually tasting the wine a little bit better. So... Okay, and then going on to the slopes here. So slope is a really important thing too in, in terroir and for wine. This is, the, this is the Burgundy area. So you don't really want to be at the top of the hill because there's not that much. You still want to have enough nutrition in the, in the soil. But you don't want to be at the bottom of the hill either because it gets really wet down there and you want to have drainage. So you kind of want to be the best vineyards you're going to see right there. It says Grand Cruz. So a lot of the vineyards are going to be, especially in cooler climates like Burgundy, are going to be right there in the middle. Not too hot, not too warm, kind of like the Goldilocks syndrome. That's where you want to be with those. Very, very basic, but this is the different things you want to know. Acid, alcohol, earth, fruit, and tannin. So anytime you drink wine, it's nice to just think, oh, we're, how much alcohol is in this, or what's the tannin like, and you know, where's the earth and the fruit? Because every time you think about that, you're drinking wine, you're going to learn a lot. And you're going to really enjoy it a lot more. And you're thinking, hey, this tastes like blueberry and tart cherry. And it sounds a little nerdy to talk about, but it's just fun. And, and you guys know more than you think you do. I mean, you'd be surprised how much you actually know. When you, especially with women, they, sensors are, sensory is actually better than men. So when they smell and wine, they like, come up with all this cool stuff and just go for it. You know, there's really no holding back for it. So... On this wine, the, to go through this wine for you guys, and the, the first wine, the Clara, the alcohol on this one is 13.5. The acidity is actually pretty high in this one for, for a normal Pinot, which is a really good thing because it helps with food. And you usually want to drink wine with food, too. And then the earth on that one is, is a nice amount of earth, too. So you kind of get that compost, pie and soil type tones, which is a nice thing, too. And you get the fruit, too, because you don't want to have no fruit. And it's not a, not a fun wine. And tannin, that tannin on that wine was probably like a medium plus, a little bit higher in tannin, which is also good. You want to have that tannin structure, else it's just kind of a, a thin wine. Um, so what you guys are going to taste on this, sir, do they have all wines on this? Does everyone have the second wine? Is that? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the question was, what is tannin? Tannin is the, it's in the skin, and it's in the, depending if they use stems and like the, the pips of the wine, if, if they crush it that far, but it's really the skin. So it's that kind of like uh, the texture that you kind of get, the heavier texture, it's kind of gritty on your mouth, and it's kind of like, oh, what is that? You know, it's more grimy, you know, that's, that's tannin. When you get, yeah, exactly, I think if you're eating like the must of the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's a nice thing, if you don't, too much tannin, you're like, oh, God, and your teeth are black, and. You know, you walk out of here looking silly, but you want to have just a little bit. Otherwise, it's just too, too thin of a wine. That's a good question. So sulfites actually grow on grapes in general. So that's the question. You guys probably always think, like, why do you know, I get headaches from sulfites. That's a big thing. And that's actually a misnomer. It's more from dehydration. Um, but sulfites are basically, there's more sulfites on a, you know, a peach than there is a lot, and a lot of times in wine. So it's not really something you need to worry about, but sulfites preserve wine. It's just a really good thing. There's this whole natural wine movement now where people are saying, no more sulfites, I don't want to use them, and you're getting these wines that are dead on arrival, and they taste oxidized, which is kind of a sour vinegar type thing, and you would never want to drink it. Yeah, so great question. So do you guys all have that wine? Okay. So this wine is made by Jason Woodbridge. It's called Layer Cake. The first wine was $50. Okay, so pretty expensive wine. This wine is 12 Okay, so you're getting a little bit more. It's actually oak chips in this wine. So it's fake oak instead of doing, you know, new French barrels. 
Um, I'm going to pass these around. You're getting more sense to you guys. Let me get these to you. Thank you. Yeah, so in this one, you guys, so you're going to get more black fruits, more black currant, blackberry, vanilla, because it's going to be more of a fake kind of vanilla, too. You're going to get more of oak, more bilberry, so more kind of more darker fruits. And the, and the alcohol in this is 14.5% compared to the other one is 13.5%. So you're getting a little bit less acidity because of the heat, a little bit more alcohol. So it's a different style of wine. It's a cheap, Jason makes great wines. It's just, it's not the same quality of the, the, the Calera wine. What do you guys think of this wine compared to the other one? Any, anyone want to blast? Yeah. Who said that? Oh, yeah. Not as, not as nice as the other one, huh? Yeah. It's more fruity and oaky. Yeah, and you, you couldn't really... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're not. There's no terroir in this. It's a California. It's just blended from everywhere around. It's. You're not getting the same minerality. You're not getting the same texture that you're getting with the first wine. So there's really no terroir in this wine at all. Not to beat it up because I never want to beat up anyone's wines, but um, it's it's just a different style. It's a hotter style. So you're gonna when you go out there today and you're tasting wines, you're gonna say. I'm getting more black fruits, more black cherry, more, uh, you know, these darker tones. It's going to be a hotter wine. So instead of the elegant, you know, more red fruit driven, which I really enjoy. And it's more, more interesting, the first wine, than this wine. It's a little bit more intellectual, which is fun. Um, and then the scents I'm, I'm seeing around you guys when you have them, number 15 is black currant, 17 is blackberry, 40 is vanilla. So you want to get that vanilla one so you could taste the oak, which is cool. And then bilberry, which is a... Go ahead. Just talking about <clears throat> the hot wines being more acidic, cooler wines maybe being a little more elegant. So if you're going to guide people towards cooler wines with that very convoluted map, what, what would be the top three or four areas you'd say focus on? Yeah, great question. I think uh, as far as Pinot Noir, Sonoma Coast is really, really good these days with some really good vineyards. Hirsch is up there. Uh, Ross Cobb wines are up there. That Sonoma is a really cool spot. Mendocino too, especially once you get up into the uh, Anderson Valley is a good area. So let's say Anderson Valley and Mendocino, which is close to the coast. Santa Cruz Mountains is, is awesome too. There, you're going to see some great stuff coming out of there with the limestone and then the Sonoma Coast. Those are probably the best cool climate spots for Pinot Noir today. If we're talking about Cabernet Sauvignon, because I know everyone likes Cabernet, once you get the hilltops in Napa, uh, Mount Veeder and the higher areas are really good for a Cabernet. That's some really cool caps coming out of there. Um, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Any other questions, you guys? On? So as far as going back to you know what is terroir really? It's really it's a broad subject and it's kind of a funny thing to talk about. I was actually talking to so Jasmine Hirsch owns Hirsch Winery. They're probably one of the best. Pinot Noir producers in all of the country. And she actually runs a thing um, where it's uh, in pursuit of balance. So everyone's pursuing balance now that there's global warming. You guys haven't heard going on. So now all the wines are getting more hot. There's more higher alcohol and everything else. So these guys are now going back to this lower alcohol style of, of wine that people like a little bit more. So I was talking to Jasmine Hirsch, and she goes, I you know, said, hey, what's the terroir of your wines? And you know, she's like, well, it's so tough to define. You know, it's just such a broad question. It's like, What's the terroir of France? You know, it's just a, it's, we're, we're getting there, but it's going to take some time, you know? And, you know, so, so what is the terroir really? It's, it's everything that's, that goes into the glasses from the uh, winemaking style to the oak to everything else. Anything that gives it, gives it a unique sense of place, you say, crap, I like this wine, I really enjoy it. That's what terroir is. So, and it's, it is a flowing, unique thing, and, you know, it's just trying to make each wine unique. So that's really terroir. Go ahead. That's a great question. Everyone's trying to answer that question now. Um, it's tough. I, I think the, the, the Calera wines, I think you get more, um, you get more minerality. You kind of get the, anybody, you also get some kind of that blueberry fruit, but it's balanced. I haven't tasted enough of them to tell you the truth. I mean, you would need to taste thousands and thousands next to each other in the same vintage because the issue is you have winemaking style. So you need to make sure, and they actually did a, they did a, a really geeky thing on this. They said, let's get all these different winemakers to make wine 
with the same grapes and not tell them what they're doing and see if it tastes the same. So there's been some really cool experiments, and we're getting there. Uh, and even in France, when you, you have to taste all those different vineyards. So, but certain ones you have, yeah, you, you get, yeah, I think the ones from uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, you get higher acid, you get bright fruit, um, you get some of that earth, and you get that elegance, too. Where you still get fruit and elegance, which is a really nice thing. That's what I get from those wines. That's a good question. Okay. Well, great. Thanks, you guys. Um, yeah, if any more questions, that's, that's about it. Okay. A lot of wine in California is made to be consumed tomorrow, right? Yep. Uh, and then some is not. And certainly wines in France are not made to be consumed immediately. What is it about the winemaking that makes, uh, winemaking in particular, as opposed to just the fruit, uh, makes one wine ageable and another, you better drink it now? Really good question. So it comes down to economics, too. You know, can, in, in, a, in a perfect world, we all want to make these, you know, amazing wines with the best fine grain oak and the best technique and everything else. So what makes it is, is really the, the acid levels on wine is, is huge for, for aging. Acid is huge and tannin is huge. So in an ideal world, a lot, a lot of the French winemakers have the luxury of having certain terroir in certain spots where they're so famous and they can charge $100 to $1,000 a bottle and they sell out in one second. So what those guys are doing a lot of time is they're doing usually a little bit more tannin on the wines. They're usually doing stems. So they'll do some cold soaking. Sometimes they'll use stems. If we're talking Burgundy, if we're talking Pinot Noir, a lot of them will use stems. A lot of them will use very, very expensive oak too. These are $1,200 barrels for each barrel. Really expensive. And so they use really the best oak in the world, obviously the best winemaking. But what they'll do is they'll have a little bit more tannin, a little bit more acid, so because they, they want to have that longevity where the wine is fantastic. In. So you co control acidity by yields, too. So if you, if you water the, the vines a lot, you're going to get a lot more grapes per, per vine. You're going to get a lot lower quality. It's going to be more of a watered-down wine. So if you, what you do is called, uh, you start cutting off, it's called, you know, um, you know, stem management, and you start cutting off grapes, you're going to get a lot less grapes per acre. You're going to get a lot better quality because you're going to get that intensity of fruit. So that costs a lot of money because if you're doing a tenth of the grapes per acre, you're going to get a lot less money. Once, at the end of the day, you're going to get a lot more quality. So it's going to be controlling yields to try to get more fruit, more concentration. It's going to be, um, at the same time, make sure you're pick, picking at the right time, too, because a lot of these guys... If you're going to make money and a rain's coming, you're going to go in there and pick that fruit and say, screw it, I don't care. I need to make some money to pay the bills. A lot of these guys don't. It, it, it's, it's a very broad question, but you know, it's basically um, you know, vine management, water management, um, how many vines per acre, um, oak management, and things like that. That gives you the really longevity and the quality, of course. Did you guys, so first wine is better than the second one, huh? Cool, okay. So that shows you, and that's quality winemaking, quality location. Um, you know, fifty dollar wine compared to a twelve dollar wine, and you know, it's a lot more enjoyable. Not that there are there are some great cheaper wines, but it's tough to do Pinot Noir really cheap. Keep in mind. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get some interesting, you know, Bourgognon level um, Burgundies too at twenty bucks, twenty three bucks sometimes too. Uh, Beaujolais is actually a cool thing now if you guys have ever heard of the Beaujolais stuff, Gamay. It's a really good, really good values. Beaujolais, if you see it on a wine list, get it. It's really, really good. Twenty bucks for Cru Beaujolais, which is good stuff. Hey, good question. So there's certain grapes, like let's take Zinfandel, for instance. It can handle a lot more alcohol. Zinfandel wines are really, really good once you get alcohol at 15%. We had a great one last night by St. Francis that was a really good one. It had 15.5% alcohol. You do a 15% alcohol Pinot Noir, and it's going to be like, what the heck is this thing? It's going to be not great. It's going to be out of balance. So there's certain grapes that really thrive in hotter climates. There's a certain grape actually in, uh, in Greece and Greece is really hot. They actually don't use any water at all. It's called uh, 
IOEA Pico, I think, is something like that. And there's no, it is a huge, it does super well in this super hot climate, and it still has high acids. There are certain grapes that just do better with that. Pinot Noir does not. It gets out of way. I know. I, but you look at the Burr count, he just, you know, someone who looks, reviews these wines, he just scores them very, very low. I, I, not my favorite style of wine. It can be done. You can do any wine in any style. And, it, and it's up to you, too. If you say, I really like this style, then that's a great thing, too. It's just you're losing that you know, sense of what the grape actually is. It's almost getting very expensive, hugely expensive. I'm just dying to comment on it. <laughs> this, this is my father. This is my father. <laughs> Do I need to say this? Okay. No, it, it, the question right here, and I think the reason why I'm dying to answer it is because it's a pet peeve with me for having drank wine for a lot longer years than Jason and everything else. In answer to your question, 30 years ago, they were doing 13.5% cabs in California, and they were doing wines in a style that was made basically for longevity and, and with their tannins and like he talked about in the construction, in the, in the structure. But <clears throat> what happens is then all of a sudden it became an economic thing and it became a rating thing. And as you started to get into the 90s and everything else, you had that the, the rating people were having a difficult time rating a wine that was supposed to be held for 20 years. And then the public says, well, why do I want to buy a wine that I got to wait 20 years to drink because that's what you tell me? So I want a wine that I can drink in a couple of years. So the style changed so that they manufactured how they made that wine so that you can pick up a cab today. And, and basically, the cabs that you go in today and they want to charge $100, $200 for were only made five years ago. Whereas before, they might not release them for seven years and they told you don't drink it for another 20. Well, the public says, well, I'm not going to do that. Then the rating, the people that were writing the scores were having a difficult time rating something that had high tannins, a lot of acidic nature in that. They knew that it was going to be better later on, so how do they score it today? So if they scored it today, then someone's going to criticize them. So then you as a public come in there and you say, you know, I want to buy this wine, but it doesn't taste very good to me. Why? Well, you're supposed to drink it 20 years from now. So, so that's what evolved in that, and I think we're trying to get back to, to the, 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 the things that make up terroir. You know, what makes it unique so that you can, you know, tell that it's from Santa Rita Valley or, or, or something like that and looks. But, you know, and Jason and I, when we drink a lot, we talk about California style, and it's a shame that when we, you know, we have manufactured that wine, we've made it so that it tastes like everyone else's. So. We take grapes from Temecula and we try to make them taste like they're from Napa because Napa is selling wine and, and you're not in Temecula. So, you know, and that's what's happening. So I, I think that, you know, we're uh, right now, even your most expensive cabs, they want you to drink it in three years and they want you to buy another one, you know, but they don't want you to hold it because everybody's frustrated. You know, the days of the seller, and it becomes pretty risky too, as best as we know. You know, in 1986, they had a cab, number one, Behringer, or I think, and then in 87 after that. And they said, this is going to be the most fabulous wine that there ever was. Ten years later, nobody even wants to drink it. They came back ten years later and said, well, that was a bad guess. <laughs> so that's what's happening a little bit, and that's why I think it, you know, all these things that Jason talks about are unique. Okay? Okay. And yeah, thanks again. Let's drink some wine. Yeah. Do we need to get those little dials? Thank you, everyone. Let's give um, Jason one more round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. And um, uh, there are many ways to connect to University of San Diego Alumni Association. I just wanted to remind you um, to, if you tweet or post anything on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram today, do hashtag USD Wine Classic so everyone can know what a fabulous time you're having here. And enjoy the Wine Classic. Thank you. Oh. And you guys, too, uh, KimmelVineyards.com is our winery. So check it out, and you can see us outside, too. Thank you. <laughs>